2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8, the Bible says, Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel, wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. It is a faithful saying for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. Of these things put them in remembrance charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Shall we pray? Father, thank you today for your word. Thank you for an opportunity to proclaim it in such a public way. And I'm glad that we can go without the doors of the church and to proclaim the good news of the word of God and all the lessons that we find and you teach us here in the scriptures. Bless now, suit a blessing to those that listen and that uh, receive the word of God. It's in Jesus' name I pray and ask it. Amen. So here in the text, as we have taught Sunday after Sunday, down to about verse 7 last week, consider what I say, that the Lord give the understanding in all things. And uh, Paul teaches these doctrines or this doctrine for the church because people need to be brought to the remembrance of it and to remember and then again to understand it. And we find folks might know it tongue in cheek. They might have heard about it, but they don't understand it. And the reason we know they don't understand it is possibly they don't, they're not doing the things the scripture says that they must do when it comes to living by the word of God. But today, he turns our attention to verse 8. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. There's a number of things going on in this verse. Number one, remember. And I guess it behooves every Christian and every saint of God in church, churches all across the land, we're to remember especially the doctrine that we see here in 2 Timothy, especially for the church. And he says, remember specifically that Jesus Christ of the seed of David, and let me just say this, it's prophesied there in the genealogies in the book of Matthew, even in Mark and Luke, and you'll find that Jesus is in the lineage of David, or David is the king after God's own heart, and that thing goes on to the future. One day, the Lord himself shall set up on the throne uh, over in the same area uh, in the promised land or the land of Israel uh, on, on the seat where David sat to rule and to reign for a thousand years. But that's a prophetical teaching and has to do with the millennial reign of Christ. But here Paul calls us to remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. And not so much about the genealogy would he have us to remember, but he would have us to remember that Christ resurrected from the dead. And that, my friend, is the power of the gospel that we preach today. That is the doctrine. That is a fundamental doctrine of the church, of Hope Baptist Church today, that we believe the scripture here teaches, and in many other places, uh, that Jesus Christ arose from the grave on the third day, just like uh, Easter season has just passed. 
the time of the Passover. And that Passover lamb prophesied early in the book of Exodus that a lamb would come and shed his blood and pay the sin debt of the world. But then yet he liveth and is alive and seated at the right end of the Father today. That is a, if you please, red line doctrine of the church. When folks don't believe that, it'd be hard to get them to remember anything else about the Word of God. So Paul specifically says, remember here that Jesus Christ, the seed of David, was raised from the dead. And then I want you to notice something. According, as the Scripture says in verse 8, according to my gospel. And this sometimes is not understood very well by Christians. And when I say Christians, I'm using the term a little loosely. When held to the context, that would be somebody that is born again, saved by the grace of God, saved by grace through faith, if you please. That would be the true definition for a Bible Christian. But today, out in the in the land, just about anybody that attends a church any place is called a Christian. Whether they believe in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ or not, whether they believe in salvation by grace through faith or not, they still get the privilege to be called a Christian. Our liberal news media uh, is big on this. They want to lump everybody into uh, that one little thing and say, well, they're all Christians. Well, according to the Bible definition, you have to be saved uh, by the blood atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ to be called a Christian. And if you're not saved, if you're trusting something else, then you possibly have put your faith in the wrong gospel. Now, be careful. Uh, look, and let's develop the thought just a little. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. So the very fact that he says he was raised from the dead according to my gospel indicates that there's probably some other gospels running around out there even to be found in the word of God that you'd have to be careful with because uh, all those Gospels do not lend themselves to salvation by grace through faith. Uh, and I, let me elaborate just a little, but before I do that, Jesus Christ being raised from the dead, that is the, that is the cornerstone of our salvation. That is the power of the preaching of the cross. So here uh, in Romans chapter 1, Paul says this, in verse 4. And declare to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Plenty of scriptural proofs that Jesus Christ is resurrected from the dead. And for if we have been planted together, that's the next, well, Romans 6, 5, if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. So not only does the Bible proclaim that Jesus Christ resurrected from the dead on the third day, it, it teaches us doctrinally that those folks that are in Christ Jesus shall be resurrected to their complete, if you please, salvation or to their home and abode with the Lord Jesus Christ one of these days. But in 1 Corinthians, Paul teaches this. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 13, but if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And the, the thinking there is everything that we do hinges on the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. So someone that doesn't believe or preach the gospel of the resurrection could be preaching the wrong gospel for the age that we live in. Think about this just for a moment. 
You say, well, they all preach the same thing from Genesis to Revelation. I bear to differ. Paul speaks of this uh, gospel as a mystery that was hidden before time and now given. And by the way, in the Old Testament, they didn't preach the cross. The cross hadn't happened yet. And the, the prophecy on the cross was vague and didn't come to full light until Jesus died on the cross and the veil was rent in the temple and then you could peer in or see in or go in to the Holy of Holies. Before that was not true. So when someone says, well, they're in Genesis to Revelation, they're all preaching the same thing, that's not true. That's a false statement. It's not a biblical statement. It's a false teaching. And so you have problems. And although everybody's called a Christian, everybody's not believing the same thing, especially when it comes to salvation. So here in the fundamental circle uh, of the independent Baptist church that takes a stand on the King James Bible and wants to rightly divide the word of truth, you will find that we believe salvation is through grace or by grace through faith, plus or minus nothing, nothing else needed to get one saved. Uh, so let me go on with the thought here in 2 Timothy, dealing with the resurrection. Peter was an authority on the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not only was Paul the apostle an authority on it, but the man Peter is an authority on it. And he says in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So Peter preaches that we are begotten, that's born again, born in him, as again unto a lively hope by the resurrection. So the resurrection guarantees your resurrected life with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let me, that verse we're dealing with, remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. The phrase, my gospel. The reason it's recorded that way, I believe the reason the Holy Spirit put it that way in the scriptures is that we might study the scriptures and know that there's not only my way or my gospel, in this case, Paul's gospel, but there's other gospels. And you got to be careful because if somebody's preaching another gospel, then they're most likely preaching a heresy. Now be careful. Say, well, it come right out of the Bible. Yes, but it has to fit the age God designed it to fit in. In other words, uh, uh, the gospel of the death, burial, and resurrection, as we stated before, didn't fit under the law in Moses' day. Moses didn't write about the death, burial, and resurrection in open, plain sight. It was always prophetical and hidden uh, in the Old Testament prophecies. So my gospel, which is in reference to what Paul preached, is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1 through 4, where Paul there spells out that this gospel contains the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's preached and taught in comparison to maybe what John the Baptist preached. You say, well, what did John the Baptist preach? Well, he didn't preach the death, burial, and resurrection because Jesus had not yet been identified when Paul the when John the Baptist was preaching. It was John the Baptist himself that uh, when when he saw Jesus coming from afar said, uh, "Behold, the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world." And so John the Baptist wasn't preaching 
the death, burial, resurrection. You say, well, Brother Phil, what in the world was he preaching? He was preaching the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he was literally preaching a message to the nation of Israel that they might uh, turn to the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. And because Jesus didn't come on the scene riding on a white horse with a crown on his head, <clears throat> they called him a king. He said he was a king, but he didn't look like a king. He looked like a poor man. He looked like the meek and lowly Nazarene. And so they didn't accept him as their king. And they rejected him. You see, even people that have a king need a savior. And not only was Jesus Christ our king, but he became our savior. And not ours only, but a savior for the sins of the whole world. But you see, the Jew rejected that. And even to this day, they reject the fact of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ as a payment for sin. They reject it. <clears throat> and you say, well, <clears throat> what's going to happen to them? Well, at least they turn and believe on the finished work that happened at Calvary. They'll die in their sins and go to a devil's hell. And God never even made hell for them, but that's where they go because they belong to the devil. They're the devil's child, if you please, spiritually speaking. Now watch. Here, in comparison to what John preached, possibly what Peter first preached, and people get over to the book of Acts, chapter 2, around verse 38, and they try to say, well, you got to repent and be baptized. But even if you get the order right and you stress the words, it doesn't say what a lot of folks say it says. They want to say, and they'll run right there to Acts 2.38, Say right there, it says you got to be baptized to be saved. And it doesn't say that at all. Say, well, John the Baptist preached uh, baptismal. Uh, you you uh, confess your sins for works meet and, and be baptized by John. And in another place, they asked him if they had received the Holy Ghost. And he said, no. He says, we've not only received the baptism of John. And so there's a distinct difference between what John preached what Peter was beginning to preach, and by the way, Peter was appealing to the nation of Israel yet and to the Jewish populace early in the book of Acts. And it isn't later on in the book of Acts when Paul comes on the scene, gets saved, and comes on the scene preaching, it's by grace. It's not by the deeds of good works or law or baptism, but solely by the grace of God. So there's other gospels running around out there. And could I go back to my text where it says, consider what I say and the Lord give the understanding in all things. And a lot of folks that claim to be Christians, a lot of folks that claim to be preachers and teachers of the word of God do not have understanding on the gospels or the different gospels found in the word of God. So Paul distinctly says, Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. If your gospel that you preach today leaves out the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and doesn't focus on those things, then you're probably preaching the wrong gospel. Well, you say, well, we're good folks and we go to church and we have our Bible but you have to rightly divide the word of truth, under, have some understanding in the word of God that your wisdom might grow in the things of God. So these are things that uh, sometimes uh, people get confused with and they say, well, why are there so many different denominations? Uh, why are the Baptists so different uh, from the Church of Christ or the Christian Church or the Catholic Church or the Pentecostal church, or on and on and on. Now, I'm not saying every church has this wrong, but I am saying there is a problem out in quote-unquote Christendom where people are preaching another gospel, which is not Paul's gospel, and they're damning souls to hell. Watch now. Let me, let me for teaching's sake, share with you at least four Gospels found in the Word of God, and yea, the fifth one 
is taking the gospel of Paul and distorting it and making it no gospel at all. Be careful now. So the gospel of the kingdom is talked about in the book of Matthew chapter 24. And by verse 14 he says, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. You say, well, what's he talking about there? That was the gospel that was supposed to be preached to the nation of Israel because they're the nation that was looking for the kingdom of God. That's not the same gospel that Paul is preaching to the church today. Yet there are people out in the religious world that are preaching there's a kingdom and we're going to make up the kingdom and we're part of the kingdom and we've got to get people into the kingdom. Well, I understand that, but don't you see the Bible says there's two kingdoms. There's the kingdom of heaven and there's the kingdom of God. And the church makes up the kingdom of God, uh, which is the spirit of God in you. And the kingdom of heaven is a literal place here on this earth and that's to come and we see it now as the millennial reign of Christ as talked about seven times in the book of Revelations. So don't get caught up with the folks that are preaching the gospel of the kingdom of, of heaven. Then there's another one. The gospel of the grace of God. Now this is possibly the one that the death, burial, and resurrection is summed up under. But he says in Acts 20, 24, But none of these things move me, neither count my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Say, what's he talking about? He's talking about late in the book of Acts, the gospel of the grace of God. Or if you please, the gospel here as he declares it, yep, the grace of God. Say, what is that? Well, our salvation is wrapped up in the love of God and the grace of God and the forgiveness of God. So when you think about these things, think about what he said. This is the good news, this gospel of the grace of God. This is what you should be preaching. And that Jesus Christ the rejected king died on the cross for our salvation. This form of the gospel is described in many ways. Today it is called the gospel of God, Romans 1.1, 1, 1, because it has its source in the love of God, as we said earlier, John 3.16. Its character is grace, as we've been saying all morning, Acts 20.24, 20, I just read it. Its subject is Christ. Romans chapter 1, verse 16, Paul said he wasn't ashamed of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Again in 2 Corinthians 10, 14. And it is the power of God unto salvation. That's the gospel of the grace of God. And it is the gospel of peace. You say, why? Because the fruit of the Spirit is connected to this gospel. Because it makes... It, it makes peace between the sinner and God and brings peace to the very soul of man when he trusts the Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians 6, 15. So that's the gospel you want. The gospel of the grace of God. We live in the day of grace. We're not living in the kingdom age. We're living the grace age. And so we want the gospel that fits our age and that's our time. Now there's another one. Thirdly, let me say this. There's the glorious gospel. And it's talked about in 2 Corinthians 4, 4 and 1 Timothy 1 and 11. The glorious gospel is that phrase or that phase of the gospel of the grace of God that speaks of him who is in the glory and has been glorified, that be Christ and who is bringing many sons to glory, Hebrews 2.10. It has special reference to his second coming and is especially comforting to those who are looking for his glorious appearing, Titus 2.13. And it is to this gospel that Satan, 
The God of all age, uh, especially of this age, is particularly anxious to blind the minds of those who believe not in the prelim premillennial coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, 2 Corinthians 4, 3 through 4. So you want to make sure you get this gospel for the age thing down. Because if you, you get in some church where they're preaching the wrong gospel, they'll be confusing people when they hear the word of God. Let me give you one more, and I've given you four. There are five that I could give you. But let me give you at least four. The fourth one here, in Revelation 14, 6, this gospel will be proclaimed just before the veil or the vile judgments when they pour out the vials. And by an angel, it is the only gospel committed to an angel. In other words, <clears throat> nobody else is preaching this gospel except this angel. The only other exception to an angel doing any preaching today is Satan himself who is transformed into an angel of light. And he's the master behind the false gospels today. So be careful with that. That's taking something from the word of God, twisting it in such a way that it sounds appealing, it sounds right, but it's, it's coming out of the wrong age or dispensation. And therefore, he can, he can blind the minds of those that believe not. Be careful. So Revelation said, it is neither the gospel of the kingdom nor of grace. Its burden is not salvation, but judgment. So that angel in the book of Revelation during the tribulation will be preaching the everlasting gospel. We don't preach that today. Wrong gospel. Say, well, what are you preaching? We're preaching Paul's gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection. We're not preaching the kingdom's coming as some, uh, some religious sects teach today. We're, we're teaching the death, burial, and resurrection. So it's good news to Israel, all who are passing through the fires of judgment, this gospel of the everlasting gospel, but it's not for the church today. Now, there's another place that I should give you before I quit here as I wind down. And, and you need to be aware of this. It's so slippery. It's so subtle and so deceptive that the devil uses it on every hand. And anywhere he can use it, he'll use it. And if you look in your Bible in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 6, and we were already in 2 Corinthians, but will not turn, there is also what he has called another gospel. And it says, which is not another, and which Paul repudiated. It is a perversion of the true gospel and has many seductive forms and in the main teaches uh, that faith is not sufficient to salvation nor able to keep and perfect and so emphasizes good works. The apostle Paul pronounced a fearful anathema upon its preachers and teachers. He said, let them be accursed. In other words, when somebody takes Paul's gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection, and adds some works to it, and adds some kingdom to it, or adds some law to it, or adds some uh, end time uh, angelic preaching as we talked about, or some everlasting gospel to it, and tries to convince you that if you're not doing these things and doing the whole thing, that you don't, you have not received the gospel. I got news for you. That's a, another gospel. And they got it right out of the word of God. And you have to be careful. So around here, you're going to find Pastor uh, Holt and Pastor Jeremiah and myself and any of our other preachers, Brother Samuel and anybody else that preaches here in the church, are going to be preaching the death, burial, and resurrection. They're going to be preaching salvation by grace through faith, plus or minus nothing. You say, why? That's awful simple. Listen, yeah, it's a simple plan, but people get so confused and so blinded by their sin and by the devil and by religion that, brother, they muddy up the water so bad. You, it, it's, it's a miracle when God saves a soul. 
So I'm glad that you've listened this morning. And next time, we'll be there in 2 Timothy chapter 2. And we'll see what other rich truth and doctrine that the Apostle Paul has for young Timothy that we can actually apply to the church today and to ourselves that we might be strengthened, that we might be edified, that we might be full of joy, as we said last week, and, and trying to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Shall we pray? Father, thank you for today. Thank you for an opportunity to teach your word. Thank you for folks that have tuned in and listened. And I pray, God, now that you would have your way as we turn our attention to the songs and to the music and to the folks that come in to hear this service. And we welcome folks to this beautiful day, this Mother's Day. And I pray, God, that you would bless. It's in Jesus' name we pray and ask it. Amen.